Hey everyone, welcome to ECE 5320 slash 6320, Introduction to Microwave Engineering. I am your instructor, Dr. James Nagel, and for today's lecture, I'd like to just give you some physical intuition about transmission lines. So what is a transmission line really? Or more broadly speaking, what exactly is transmission line theory? Well, if you remember from basic circuit theory, there was a tendency to treat cause and effect as if they happened simultaneously. So for example, you imagine just a resistive network of cir or a network of resistors in some circuit, right? And I have a voltage source with a switch and I, and I close the switch and that voltage excites the circuit and immediately, instantaneously, a bunch of voltage and currents just are suddenly everywhere else on every device in the circuit. So the cause and the effect happen instantaneously with each other. And most of the time, that's a pretty good assumption and it gives you good results. And you don't have to account for the fact that there, there is technically a finite delay. It's just that usually it's so infinitesimally tiny that it just doesn't matter from your perspective. The reality, however, is that there is a finite propagation delay between cause and effect in these circuits. Or that is to say, a change in one piece of the circuit will take time to manifest as an effect in somewhere else in the circuit. And transmission line theory is kind of the study of how to model that kind of behavior. So a great way to visualize this is with the parallel two conductor transmission line here. So you imagine all the way on the left, we have some voltage source, a generator V sub G, and it has a, an output resistance R sub G. And there's this big long length of cable connecting it to some load all the way on the other end of the circuit. Now what that means is you can imagine some sudden change in the circuit at the generator end will take time to have an influence at the opposite end. That is to say, there's, a, there's this finite delay as energy propagates from one end down to the other. So that, that thing on the right, we call it a load. And one of the, the quintessential loads is usually something like an antenna, right? But there are also many other possibilities for what that load could be. It could be an amplifier, it could be a filter, could just be a lumped resistor, say, there's something happening over there on the end of, other end of the circuit. And usually we use the word load to define the thing we're trying to excite with energy. We also have two wires. There's a signal wire and the reference wire. It's also common to refer to the reference wire as a ground wire, although I personally don't really like that name uh, because ground tends to imply charge neutral when really that's not what's going to happen in this system. You'll also notice that we are referencing R0 at the load. And that's because most of the time it's mostly convenient to think of transmission lines in terms of the distance away from the load. So we define zero there on the right and negative L length of that transmission line over on the left. You also notice we, we tend to represent this as two parallel wires, but in reality, it's just any two parallel conductors. So for example, it might be coaxial cable or it could be a microstrip line, uh, but we just visualize it as wire. But just keep in the back of your mind, it doesn't actually have to be little thin wires. Uh, it could be any just sort of parallel conductors we like. So I'd like to give you a thought experiment. Imagine that generator there is normally off and then I turn it on for a very tiny little moment of time, like say a, you know, a nanosecond or 10 nanoseconds here. So I've drawn this little square pulse of 10 nanosecond duration and then it just turns right back off again. So in your mind, just think physically what has to happen in terms of the motion of charge along these conductive wires. So you imagine I turn the voltage on and what it's gonna do, it's gonna pull positive charge away from the bottom line, the reference line, and then insert it onto the signal line. So what you'll have a moment later after that voltage turns back off again is a picture that now looks like the following. So you notice because there was that current moving to the left from the, the reference line, what has happened is it removed positive charge from that line and then deposited it onto the signal line. So there's this net little cluster of positive charge on the signal line, leaving behind a deficit of charge on the reference line. So there's this net negative charge left behind on the reference at the bottom. Now, because of that charge separation, there exists an electric field between them. And because there is current that I had to physically move charges in order to make that happen, now there are magnetic fields on top of those electric fields as well. So remember your electromagnetic field theory. Changing electric fields create magnetic fields and changing magnetic fields 
create new electric fields in this kind of never ending cycle here, which means you're going to get an electromagnetic wave speeding down that line. So now what you do is you imagine a few nanoseconds later, that little cluster of, ch of charge has moved down the line. It's just gonna speed along at nearly the speed of light until either it just uses up all the energy or it hits something or whatever. The point is it's going to move along as an electromagnetic wave with this separation of charge along the conductors. A lot of things can happen when it strikes the load, but there are two special cases I want to examine in this discussion. The first is of course the open circuit load. So what happens if I just take away everything and just let those wires dangle in space, okay? Well, obviously the, the charge can't just leap off of the wire because it takes energy to pluck the charge out of the wire to begin with. So what happens is all that charge is bound to the conductor and it just hits the end of the line and then squishes up and onto itself and then rebounds in the opposite direction. So what you get is a picture of all that charge squishing on the end and then bounces back almost like a spring. It, it, it is almost like an, uh, an elastic collision, you can think. So what you have is the same positive charge on top with the same negative charge on bottom. So the voltage hasn't changed. There's still a positive voltage between the signal and the reference line. But now everything's moving in the opposite direction. So I have a positive charge moving to the left implies a negative current. So the current has switched signs. And likewise on the bottom, I have negative charge moving to the left, which means now there is a positive current on the reference line. So you notice this is why an open circuit preserves the voltage. The voltage did not change sign, but the current did, because now I have the same charges just moving in the opposite direction. Next, I want you to think about the opposite scenario. The, the polar opposite of an open circuit is now a short circuit. So basically I've just soldered two wires to the, between the signal and the reference line. So in your mind, just imagine a little, what do you expect to have to happen here? Uh, so it's intuitive to think maybe all that charge will just come back together and recombine, but there's still all that energy stored in the electric and magnetic fields. So what happens is in, they don't just come back together and become neutral again. They actually whisk right into each other and trade places. So you see, it's almost like the negative charge just moved along and moved up to the signal line while all that positive charge just passed right on through and went down to the reference line. And then they speed across or they speed back in the opposite direction, only now having switched sides. So now we have negative charge on top moving to the left, which implies a positive current and I have positive charge on the bottom moving to the left, implying a negative current. And we also see that the negative, po uh, negative charge on top is different from before. So I have negative on top, positive on bottom, which implies a negative voltage. So everything's now propagating to the left, but the voltage changed sign while the current remained the same. So that's, that's how you, intuitively you can imagine the, the oppositeness of <laughs> the open circuit versus the short circuit. The open circuit preserved voltage, but changed the sign of the current, whereas the short circuit preserved the sign of the current, but changed the sign of the voltage.